Just real quick through uh, some of our upcoming events. You can see them, they've been running for those that have been in the waiting room. You should have been able to see those. And of course, uh, Reared Mansion is managed by the Arizona Historical Society. And our mission is connecting people through the power of Arizona's history. The, um, so Reared Mansion is currently closed. That's why we're doing this lunchtime lecture as a virtual event. Uh, the grounds are closed as well. And over at Pioneer Museum, our closed, but the grounds are open. But make sure you visit our Arizona History Digital Hub at the Arizona Historical Society website so that you can see all the upcoming stuff as well as lots of hands-on materials. And you can even see the resilience exhibit from Pioneer Museum is all there. Join us on Facebook. Um, and of course, this week starts the best 10 days of the year. Uh, the Flagstaff Festival Science is virtual this year, so make sure you visit their website and uh, uh, see all the cool events that are going on. And our um, exciting uh, membership benefits. Once we do get all our Arizona Historical Society museums open, it's a great deal to become a member and uh, enjoy the Journal of Arizona History. And the Grand Canyon National Park Special Edition is available at Pioneer Museum for curbside pickup. And of course, sign up for uh, newsletters and events on the uh, website for the Arizona Historical Society. So I'm super excited to introduce uh, Ted today and his presentation on the ecology of the Colorado River and results of bug flow monitoring. I'm super excited about this because I've been part of many uh, Grand Canyon youth trip that has helped collect some of this data. So it's all yours, Ted. I'm going to stop sharing this screen. All right, thank you. You can share thank yours. You. Thank you. Ed. Um, it's a pleasure to be here today, closing out uh, the wonderful Colorado River Days Festival. I, um, I love that I already learned something new um, today. I, I was always wondering what the fancy X was about. So um, I'm gonna go share that with my family once, once we're done with this uh, talk here. Let's see, I'm gonna start sharing my screen here. So uh, I'm excited to share these, um, these results with you. It's, it's a story that we've been putting together, me and um, my team uh, for the last uh, many years. I'm going to start by uh, zooming out though and and you know here pictured here is Glen Canyon Dam and so my my team has been you know trying to understand how operations of this dam are affecting the ecology of the Colorado River and Grand Canyon and so we're really excited about uh, this bug flow experiment that's been going on for a couple of years but before we sort of dive into Grand Canyon I want to just zoom out a little bit and and talk about you know dams uh, throughout the world and, and hydropower and and um, and sort of set some background context for y'all. So um, let's see here. So yeah, um, dams and river regulation are a, a huge global phenomenon. This is a, a figure from a, a big synthesis that was done back in 2005. Um, essentially, there's over 800,000 dams throughout the world. And the majority of moderate to large rivers uh, throughout the world are dammed. Uh, there's lots of practical uh, reasons for building dams, you know, things like flood control, water storage. Increasingly, uh, one of the main motivations for building dams uh, throughout the world is this last one here, power generation. So yeah, hydropower is a, a really significant uh, renewable resource. Uh, back in 2000 at least, nearly 20% of the world's electricity was coming from hydropower and sort of the total output of hydropower exceeded uh, all the other uh, common renewables combined. And uh, th these numbers are changing uh, as solar and wind have been built up, but, but nonetheless, hydropower remains a really significant uh, source of electricity globally and, and among renewables. And then here's a, a graph or a map showing you know, hydropower in the US. So, 
Uh, this is showing existing hydropower facilities on the left here. There's 130 gigawatts of installed capacity. Um, and then but, uh, the many dams were built uh, without generation um, capacity. And so the uh, Oak Ridge National Lab has estimated that if, if um, existing dams were retrofitted, uh, we could um, pick up an extra 65 gigawatts of untapped potential throughout the U.S. So hydropower is a really big thing in the U.S. and it could become bigger because of retrofitting dams. And then, let's see, I'm going to just stop sharing my video. And then, yeah, on the global stage, uh, there's a lot of hydropower development planned. Uh, so this map is showing projected uh, planned or, or under construction facilities throughout the world. You see that there's no new facilities planned for the lower 48, but places like uh, India and uh, the, Him the Himalayan region, uh, South America are, are uh, many, many new dams are under construction or are planned. The number of hydropower dams uh, is scheduled to double by 2040. So, so getting back to Grand Canyon now, uh, what happens when we when a big 700 foot tall dam like Glen Canyon is installed? Well, one of the biggest things uh, is the, is the river takes on a new physical template. So the water temperature, the flow regimes, all of those things change uh, when we dam a river. And because of that new physical template, we see typically the the loss of some species and the addition of of new species. And so I'll just sort of review a few few examples of, of how the template has changed and how that's led to changes in the species that we have present. So one of the biggest uh, changes that we've seen in, in Grand Canyon is a, a big change in water clarity. So this graph here on the left is showing what's known as turbidity. This is essentially how, how muddy the water is. Uh, this red line up here on the top of this graph shows uh, an estimate of pre-dam turbidity levels over the course of an annual cycle. So the river was, was you know, really quite muddy uh, year round. And then with the closure of Glen Canyon Dam in 1963, uh, we're down on this black line here on this graph. The, um, the post-dam river is much, much clearer, a thousand times clearer. And because of that, uh, things like filamentous algae have, have proliferated. Whereas before, right, we, uh, the, the water was so muddy that there likely wasn't much in the way of algae production. The food web was probably supported by decomposing leaf litter and, and things like that. Another really significant change in the physical template of the Colorado River has been the water temperature. So this graph is showing water temperature of the river uh, going all the way back to 1949. And you can see here when Glen Canyon Dam was, was put in place in, in 63, you can see the water temperature started to narrow. And then by the time the reservoir filled in the, in the late 70s, uh, the water, water temperature had become cold and constant. And so um, because of that cold and, and relatively constant water temperature, uh, we created conditions that were really uh, suitable, well suited to things like rainbow trout, a non-native species that was introduced to provide for fishing opportunities. So yeah, clear or colder water uh, leads to uh, a case of an addition, a new species uh, that was introduced and really well suited. And then uh, another big, big change to the physical template of the river has been uh, to the, the flow regime. So this graph is showing in yellow, uh, this is for the year 2008, uh, this yellow line is an estimate of the natural flow through Grand Canyon were the dam not present. And then this turquoise line shows the, the actual flows. And so this was the year of a, of a spring high flow experiment. Uh, but you can see uh, this blue line here compared to the yellow line, right? We've, we've eliminated the high and low flows from that, that uh, free flowing river. And then uh, this banding here that you see in the, in the turquoise line, this, this uh, striping, that is because of, of daily basically increases and then decreases in flow in response to changing uh, power demands uh, throughout the West. And so Glen Canyon Dam is a, is what's known as a load following or a hydro peaking dam. And, and the, at night when uh, hydropower demands are low, the, the flow of the 
the discharge out of the dam is is generally low and then in the morning as people wake up and and you know factories turn on and things like that the demand for power increases dramatically and so to meet that increasing demand uh, flow through the dam is increased and so because of that we have this uh, essentially it's a three foot uh, tide uh, in Grand Canyon because of, of the, the load following operations out of the dam. And so, um, yeah, so we've, we've looked at a few cases of, of species additions that have happened because of, of this new physical template. We don't have really good pre-dam uh, biological data available for Grand Canyon. So we can't sort of look and ask, you know, what's happened to invertebrate assemblages in Grand Canyon easily. But there's uh, other dams up in the in the watershed where where there's better pre pre dam biological data. So in the Green River, uh, high up in in the watershed up in uh, Utah, uh, prior to Flaming Gorge Dam being put in. Uh, there was there was collections available, and and a guy named Mark Benson basically tracked down all these museum specimens and figured out that there was at least 30 species of mayflies present in the Green River uh, in the Flaming Gorge stretch before the dam was put in, and then after the the dam was closed, uh, he found that tw 28 of these uh, mayfly species were lost. So. We we know that there's big there can be big losses of invertebrates, you know in in places where where dams go in because of this work. And so all of that leaves us in Grand Canyon at least with what we we kind of call uh, affectionately the Franken food web. So we have we have this mix of of native species like the, this endangered humpback chub pictured here on the the far right. Uh, we have new new things though like a, a food web that's based on filamentous algae we have introduced invertebrates like these these scuds. These were introduced. Uh, they really thrive in these these rich algae conditions, and uh, things like mud snails and rainbow trout. And so we have this really an, it's a no analog food web. There's there's really nothing like it in the world. And and so we um, my group uh, set out to basically try and understand how this this food web operated back. Um, Back in the in the late aughts, and so we we conducted these these food web studies where we, you know, we looked at who eats whom and in what quantity, and we we wanted to see you know how how these these food webs were structured and and also how they functioned, and uh, what these studies uh, told us was that uh, these food webs were really built on algae. So you can see um, these these diagrams represent food webs at different locations through the canyon. Uh, the left side of the webs are, are algal based pathways and then the right side of the webs are, are these detritus based pathways. And so you can see that in general these, these algal pathways were really important in uh, everywhere, everywhere you went from, from Lee's Ferry up near the dam all the way to far downstream. And then this work also showed us that uh, these food webs were were really simplified and inherently unstable. So especially this middle level of the food web, this is the invertebrate level. This is really simplified compared to what you would find in, in other sort of um, less affected ecosystems. And then finally, uh, we also found that uh, the fish, fish populations, this top level in these webs, uh, they appeared to be limited by the amount of, of bug meat that was being produced at this middle level. And so we, we basically concluded that the, the fish populations appeared to be constrained, at least in some way, by, by the diversity and the production of the invertebrate trophic level, the invertebrate um, feeding level. And and so you know some of you might be asking, well, shoot, you know, does it really matter to have you know just a few insects? Um, and and the answer is yes. Uh, according to the Fish and Wildlife Service, this is a table from their uh, recent five-year assessment of endangered humpback chub. Um, and so they identified uh, different different um, factors that might constrain chub populations. And in Grand Canyon, at least, they identified that the lack of an adequate and reliable food supply was the single greatest issue um, threatening chub in Grand Canyon, at least. So, 
So, so those food web studies really, really motivated um, our group to, to try and understand, you know, what was going on with the invertebrate um, populations in Grand Canyon. So um, why, why are things like mayflies, stoneflies, and caddisflies absent from Grand Canyon? Well, these, these insect orders are collectively known as EPT for the, uh, the first letter of their order names. And, you know, these, are, these, these groups, these three insect groups are used throughout the world as, as biological indicators. Uh, they're essentially like a canary in a coal mine. And so what uh, this graph is showing is, is the invertebrate richness in, in uh, Colorado River tailwater. This is high up in, in the Green River up in Wyoming, Fontenelle Dam. Up in Fontenelle, there are over 50 unique genera of invertebrates, including many of these EPT taxa. Uh, at Flaming Gorge, that site that we talked about earlier, uh, there's, there's over uh, something like 40, 49 species or unique genera of invertebrates, including many of these EPT. And then in Glen Canyon, here on the far right, we see we have, we have 12 uh, common genera and no EPT. And we only have really two, two common aquatic insects, mayflies and, and um, sorry, <laughs> midges and blackflies. And so, you know, when we started uh, looking at different uh, tailwaters and, and looking at the invertebrate assemblages and the level of richness, we realized that there really was a, you know, there was something that had gone wrong, we think, in, in Glen Canyon. And so we, we, you know, we're just trying to figure out what, what the heck could have happened. And so, um, you know, to try and put what was going on in Grand Canyon in perspective, one of the, one of the things we did was we zoomed out and we looked at at dammed rivers throughout the Western United States. And so this map on the left shows some of the, uh, the sites where we were able to collect data from or where pre-existing data were available. And then we, we computed what's known as this EPT metric. So this is the number, you know, you go out and collect stream bottom samples of invertebrates, and then you would uh, count up the number of EPT specimens in those samples and then uh, divide that by the total number of invertebrates in the sample to get a sense of the percentage of the assemblage that's, that's those EPT taxa. And we also computed uh, this hydro peaking index. This is basically how, what's the magnitude of the tides in each of these different places. And so what we saw was that um, on, the, on the Y axis here is this invertebrate diversity, insect diversity metric the percentage of, of mayflies, stoneflies, or caddisflies in the assemblage. And we saw, you know, when we looked at all these different dammed rivers in the West, if you have low um, magnitude of hydropeaking, low tides or no tides, essentially you can have diverse assemblages that include lots of these EPT taxa. But as you ratchet up the intensity of those tides here and move more towards the right on this graph, you see that the percentage of EPT declines and eventually approaches uh, zero in places like B here, which is Glen Canyon, and then A here is, is Hoover Dam. And at Hoover Dam, they have uh, it's just essentially a 10-foot daily tide. So when we, when we made this graph, we realized that it was something about this, this hydropower operation that uh, was going on at, at Glen Canyon that, that was likely contributing to the low diversity of the insect assemblage and the low production overall of, of that insect assemblage. And um, essentially what, what we found when we started studying the entire life cycle of these aquatic insects was that um, you know, a lot of the food web studies we had done really just focused on this larval life stage here. And this is actually a really common strategy for monitoring insect populations really throughout the world um, is collecting larval samples. And when we, when we stepped back and we started looking at some of these other life stages of these aquatic insects, we, we realized that um, this egg stage typically is, is, occurs right on the margins of rivers. And so when you add, um, right, obligate river edge egg laying habitats for many of these aquatic insects, when you add that with this three foot tide that I'm showing here on the right, this is a hydrograph of Glen Canyon Dam back in 2018. When you 
when you add these things together, you get a, a potentially a life history bottleneck for aquatic insects. So we think uh, basically that there's acute mortality of, of insect eggs going on because of these tides and that that's, that's maybe the primary cause of this low diversity and low production for this uh, insect assemblage in Grand Canyon. And I wanna just, uh, I guess, pause and point out that um, one of the things that was absolutely critical to, to you know, <laughs> arriving at this conclusion was uh, the role of citizen science. So. Uh, when we set about studying these these other life stages of aquatic insects, uh, one of the one of the things we started doing was partnering with river guides, and uh, having them put out uh, these simple light traps each night in camp. And so here's a picture on the left of one of these light traps. So these light traps are de deployed in a standardized fashion. Um, the, the light traps let out for or put out for an hour each night in camp. And then at the end of the hour, the, the sample is, is put back into a bottle. And then at the end of the river trip, uh, the bottles come back to our USGS lab and, and they're counted. And so this graph on the right, and so these, these, uh, these light trap samples are really effective at catching the adult uh, life stage of those aquatic insects. And then this, this, um, this figure on the right here shows the, the incredible coverage that we're able to get by partnering with citizen scientists. So, you know, on the, on the y-axis here is essentially time. And then on the x-axis here is distance from the dam. And so um, each one of these open circles represents a different light trap collection over the course of uh, the first three years of our light trapping effort. And then these filled circles represent sort of a typical sampling coverage that you might get from, you know, professional scientists uh, doing river trips and collecting samples themselves. And, the, and those blue dots actually represent the coverage that we had with our food web studies back in the late aughts. So this uh, incredible spatial and, and temporal coverage that we're getting through citizen science was absolutely critical to sort of uh, working out this, this story in terms of how the, the load following and hydropeaking was affecting aquatic insect populations. And so, yeah, just to try and wrap all that together, uh, we have this conceptual diagram here. Um, on, the, on the right, you know, we have um, a place like Glen Canyon where, where uh, you know, you have a dammed river plus an artificial intertidal zone. And we think that um, right these these tides um, have have um, right led to um, acute egg mortality. So these critical egg laying sites are lost now, and because of that, we we tend to have low density and low diversity in Glen Canyon. And you know we think that is affecting wildlife populations, things like fish, but also uh, things like birds and bats when these when these insects emerge from the river. Uh, they're a really important food resource for for lots of uh, terrestrial wildlife, and so the you know the goal of this uh, this bug flow operation that that we're going to start talking about now is to essentially try and move this picture so it looks more like like the river on the left, where you know you have a dam, you have a changed river with a new physical template, but because you're providing uh, these key critical egg laying sites uh, that we could have higher diversity and higher density of aquatic insects and therefore healthier uh, wildlife populations, more fish, more, you know, more rainbow trout up near the dam, but also more humpback chub uh, far downstream in Grand Canyon. You know, the hope is that essentially a rising tide will float all boats. So all fish would benefit from, from this proposed action or this, this action. And so, yeah, bug flows, um, you know, this, this is an exciting experiment that's been tested at Glen Canyon during the months of May to August over the last three years from 2018 to 2020. Uh, it's, it's going on uh, during the months of May to August because that's when our citizen science uh, indicated that most of the adult aquatic insects were, were out and laying eggs. And so the, the goal of this bug flow is to basically give bugs the weekends off. Um, you know, we, we, we think that there's this acute bottleneck at the egg stage, but you know, aquatic insects can be really prolific 
and an individual female, say midge or mayfly, can lay hundreds to thousands of eggs. So we don't think we need to provide perfect egg can, egg laying conditions, you know, year round. It could be if we just provide really good egg laying conditions for these aquatic insects every weekend, that that could be enough to overcome this bottleneck. And so by having stable and low flows on weekends only, uh, it will minimize impacts to hydropower production at Glen Canyon Dam. And then, you know, any eggs that get laid on the weekends are going to uh, stay wet and not, not dry out. And that's because the flow on these weekends is at the right, the, the typical low flow for, for that week or that month. And so, you know, on Monday morning, when flows come back up after a weekend of low flows, we don't think those eggs will have necessarily hatched yet, but they'll at least stay wet and we'll, we'll have a chance to hatch in the coming days. And so this, this figure on the left is showing uh, some midge eggs that were laid right at the water's edge. Um, up in Glen Canyon during a, a bug flow weekend. And so here I wanna um, sh share with you a, a time-lapse video that we made that shows uh, these bug flows in action. And so this uh, video time-lapse comes from up in Glen Canyon. This is back in 2018 during the first weekend of bug flows. So this is a Sunday, um, one photo every hour. You can see these nice stable flows. Lots of emergent rocks here too. These emergent rocks turn out to be really important egg laying sites for these aquatic insects. So now this is the following morning, Monday. And in these photos, you can see this, this thin yellow line at the water's edge. And so these are, you know, tens of thousands of eggs that were laid by midges over the course of that, that weekend of bug flows. And you can see the, the tide comes up really dramatically. This is a site real near the dam. And so all those emergent rocks, except for one, are gone now, right? Now keep your eye on that red circle. Uh, what we're gonna see is the next day when the water goes down, the bugs were busy overnight, it turns out. And so you can see this little patch of yellow midge eggs, right, that are now three feet out of water. Those were laid the, the previous night. So these eggs have been out of water for many, many hours. Our group has done some desiccation trials and essentially these, these insect eggs can only handle, you know, 30 minutes, an hour of exposure to air and then they, they die. And so these eggs are, are more than likely dead. And so, yeah, the cycle repeats itself. So here's a, a Wednesday, uh, the same midge eggs up there. And so, yeah, just to sort of that, we, we managed to catch this process in action through this, this incredible time lapse. Uh, you know, with bug flows, we, we, we are seeing lots of egg laying activity right at the water's edge. Uh, with load following flows here on the right, we're seeing many of these eggs that are left high and dry. And so this, really um, in our minds confirmed, you know, that the mechanism where, where eggs are being killed essentially by the tides, uh, that mechanism was, was really well worked out because of this time-lapse video and other, other sorts of data streams. And so, yeah, what I'm gonna do next is just share with you a few of the, the key data slides that we've had sort of evaluating whether or not this, this bug flow experiment has been, been effective. And so here, um, here is, is showing you the annual average catch rates across, it's about, a, we, you know, we collect about a thousand light traps per year. And so this is showing the average annual trend in midges that are in these light traps and then also caddis flies. This is one of those EPT, the trichoptera. So we do get these caddis flies, but it's at really no, low numbers. And so we have basically six years of, of pre-bug flow data to set a baseline, you know, for, for what, you know, bug densities are like in these light traps. And then during the first year of the, the bug flow experiment back in 2018, we saw something that just blew our socks off. We saw a 400% increase in those caddis flies that are shown on the bottom slide there. So 
400% increase. Um, midges, a lot of variability there, you know, um, no clear signal in the midges, but that caddisfly signal was just enormous and really was exactly kind of what we were hoping for with, with this experiment. And then in 2019, um, the, this experiment was replicated. So a second year of this, this steady flows every weekend. And we sure had our fingers crossed that we were gonna see, you know, those, those increases in caddisflies sustained, but that's not at all what happened. We saw a return back to earth where, you know, caddisflies, this was 2019 was, was still the second most abundant caddisfly catch in the whole data set, but it was, you know, very clearly back to the baseline value. We saw a modest increase in midges in 19 compared to 2018, but, you know, this, this really left us scratching our heads. Like what, you know, it, it sure seems suggestive, right? To have a 400% increase in caddisflies during the first year of this experiment. And then, you know, what could cause it to come crashing back down the next year? And so, you know, we looked at a lot of, you know, diagnostics. We, we really sorted through the data to, to look for patterns that might help explain why 2018 was such a strong year and why 2019 was such a, sort of meh year. And one of the, one of the things that uh, was really insightful was when we started looking at the phenology of, of emergence across these different years. So phenology is the study of cyclic and seasonal phenomena, and uh, it's especially, you know, in relation to things like climate. And so some examples of, of phenology would be, say, differing times when birds begin migrating or say different times of, of seed sprouting in your garden. And so we, we basically did the, the same thing. We, we looked at, at the entire light trap data set and we asked, you know, when was the peak of emergence in each of these different years uh, that we have data for? Again, because the phenology, the timing of things like emergence is an indicator of the climate or the growing conditions. And so what we, what we found when we started looking at the phenology across these different years was that um, generally things were really late in 2019. So this graph here is showing basically the, um, the phenology of caddisfly emergence. And so this thick yellow line here, uh, right here represents the, uh, the average of all of those pre bug flow years. And then this, this darker blue line is the phenological pattern for the first year of bug flows. And then this turquoise line is the phenological pattern for 2019. And so in 2019, emergence of caddisflies basically happened a, a full one and a half months later than it had back in 2018. And similarly for midges, we saw midge emergence in, in 19 was a full three and a half months later than it was in 2018. And so emergence timing is an indicator of growing conditions. And so, you know, from this, we basically concluded that growing conditions in 2019, the second year of that bug flow experiment were, were likely really poor. And at this point, it looks like uh, the main reason why growing conditions were were so poor was because of uh, an exceptionally muddy spring. So in 2019, emergence was the latest in, in eight years of monitoring. That was true for both midges and for caddisflies. And so this, this graph here on the right is showing the, the on the x-axis, it's the cumulative mud at a gauging station down in Grand Canyon. And this is a logarithmic axis. So these are, you know, um, the values out here for 2019 are, are like a, a 10 times greater than, than the values that we saw back in 2018. So yeah, it looked like really poor growing conditions in 19 uh, and the likely cause was an exceptionally muddy spring. And uh, we, we think that we know that interferes with feeding for many of these, these invertebrates. And then, and then going back to uh, some of those slides at the, the start of my talk, right? We have a, a food web that's really based on algae. And so we think that 2019, right, there, there wasn't that algal food out there to sustain uh, these aquatic insects. And uh, in our minds, this underscored the need for additional years of replicates of bug flows. 
And so that's what's uh, happening this year in 2020. We just wrapped up the third year of bug flows. They, they occurred from May to August again. So steady flows during the weekends. And then um, unfortunately we're, we're um, you know, obviously, right, there's been a lot going on this year and uh, the river was closed uh, owing, to the owing to the virus. So we didn't have any river trips until June of 2014, uh, June 14th. And so we're, you know, here's our map of citizen science coverage. We definitely are gonna have a big blank spot early in the season, but um, we think we're gonna still have pretty high statistical power even with that delayed start. Uh, we should get something like 500 samples. And we're optimistic that we're gonna, as long as we can still sort of see or observe the, the peak hatch in midges and caddisflies, we'll think, we think we'll have pretty good power to detect change and sort of see what happened to the invertebrate populations during this third year of bug flows. So I don't have any monitoring data from 2020 to share with you just yet, but I do have some exciting text messages with um, a friend that works up at Lee's Ferry. So um, here's a screenshot of, of some texts that I exchanged with Terry Gunn. He's a, he's a lodge owner up at, at Lee's Ferry and he's a long-time fishing guide. And, he texted me back there uh, last uh, last day of August and, and basically talked about how the hatches were, seemed to be really exceptional. And, and, you know, in his experience, his 40 years of experience fishing up there, you know, typically the, the hatches have really died off by the time you get to August. And so this was really encouraging to me, you know, um, that, that he's, he's seeing something and then he, uh, he texted me again uh, on Thursday last week and, and basically said the, the midge hatches seem to still be going strong. So, um, you know, uh, hopefully, uh, hopefully soon we're gonna have some data, but uh, I'll, I'll sure take these observations in the meantime. And then, yeah, conclusions, just to try and sort of wrap all this up. Um, life history, um, studying the entire life history of, a, of an animal, whether it's an insect or a, you know, a, a cute furry mammal, uh, that can be really important to, to understanding how to better manage the species. And so, you know, looking at these aquatic insects, we, uh, in studying the entire life cycle, we, we think we really got some key insights that helped us design a really cost-effective solution to improving you know, conditions for these aquatic insects. And, uh, and then, yeah, finally, uh, citizen science has turned out to be this incredible, incredibly powerful and, and low cost tool for, for doing research in, in, a, in a place like Grand Canyon. And then I wanna just, uh, yeah, close by thanking um, all of my great colleagues here at, at the USGS. These are, you know, 15 of the, uh, the best colleagues and I want to especially give a shout out to the three that are in the top left there, Jeff Muehlbauer, Anya Metcalf, and Morgan Ford. Uh, they're, they're key folks in my lab group who have overseen the processing and, and analysis and curation of, it's something like, you know, 5 million insect uh, specimens. So I uh, really want to acknowledge them for all the work that they've done helping, uh, helping build this, this neat story. And so that's, that's all I prepared. Uh, I'm happy to take questions if there's time. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ted. We've been having uh, some great questions in the uh, chat that Allison has been helping to answer for you. Oh, cool. <laughs> so my, my work is done. <laughs> Uh, Trenton asked about uh, the tides, and Allison did a great job explaining the tides, which are basically caused by the flows. And let's see. And we missed what caused the spike in the 2018 comparison with previous years. Uh, Allison uh, answered that 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 was the first year of the tides or, yeah. or the uh, the flows. Um, So weekend releases were more sporadic before 2018. Yeah, basically the um, on the you know 
So before 2018, is that the question? Yeah, basically, um, you know, these tides normally happened every day, you know, even on the weekends. And uh, even, and basically, you know, the, the, the whole idea behind this bug flow was to, um, you know, to, to have these stable low flows on weekends when the hydropower is not um, as critical. There's not as much demand. So, uh, yeah, does that make sense? Thank you. Uh, yeah. And Alisa asks, can you describe a little more about how you recruited and trained citizen scientists? Yeah. Um, it, well, first of all, we are we are paying a, a modest stipend, so that always helps, you know, to incentivize things. Um, but it, you know, it's been really uh, really easy, actually. You know, the the river guides, especially uh, that we work with, they're so passionate about the the ecosystem, right? And they spend, you know, a hundred days a year down there. And so, you know, in my experience, they, they're really excited uh, at the possibility of helping understand the ecosystem and, and helping inform management. So uh, yeah, it's, it's been a pretty easy process. We just at the start of the season, send out an email and, and uh, recruit people and, and um, yeah, there you have it. Okay. Uh, there's no other questions in the chat if people would like to uh, we're going to go ahead and stop the recording here but if you would like to unmute yourself and uh, 